So, uh, this is a very long passage, right, from 144 through to uh, 145, but um, it's interesting because it looks at Marlowe's realization uh, with regards to barbarity and civility and his redefining of those two terms because he makes a, a bit of a revelation about the savages on board of his steamboat. Okay? So, just starting at the top. Uh, I went forward and ordered the chain to be hauled in short so as to be ready to trip the anchor and move the steamboat at once, if necessary. Will they attack? whispered the awed voice. We will be all butchered in this fog, murmured another. The faces twitched with the strain. The hands trembled slightly. The eyes forgot to wink. It was very curious to see the contrast of expressions of the white men and of the black fellows of our crew, who were as much strangers to that part of the river as we, though their homes were only 800 miles away. The whites, of course, greatly discomposed, had besides a curious look of being painfully shocked by such an outrageous row. The others had an alert, naturally interested expression, but their faces were essentially quiet. Even those of the one or two who grinned as they hauled at the chain, several exchanged short grunting phrases which seemed to settle the matter to their satisfaction. Their headman, a young, broad-chested black, severely draped in dark blue fringed clothes with fierce nostrils and his hair all done up artfully in oily ringlets, stood near me. Aha, I said, just for good fellowship's sake, catch him, he snapped with a blood shot widening of his eyes and a flash of sharp teeth. Catch him. Give him to us. To you, eh? I asked. What would you do with them? Eat him, he said curtly, and leaning his elbow on the rail, looked out into the fog in a dignified and profoundly pensive attitude. I would no doubt have been properly horrified had it not occurred to me that he and his chaps must be very hungry, that they must have been growing increasingly hungry for at least this month past. All right. Before we move into this little revelation, for starters, you get a contrast in this opening between uh, how the, the white people view uh, the howling that they're hearing and how the black people view it, right? One group views, as it, uh, views it in a, in a horrific way. They're petrified. They're really concerned. The others are curious. Okay, so uh, that's already a real clear distinction between how people view others because for the, um, the native crew that are on board, this is not their, their area of origin. They wouldn't have belonged to this place. You know, even though they're not as further away as the, the Europeans, they're still, what is it, 800 miles? Yeah. All right? So they're not from around here, okay? But there is a contrast between you know, horrified Europeans. Yeah, okay, so horrified Europeans and curious natives, right? Curious natives who are looking at it and uh, Marlowe is picking up on this distinction, right? So that's the first thing that intrigues him. The next thing that intrigues him is... Um, he comes to a realization after they've had this conversation about the fact that, hey, catch them, we're hungry. That'll be dinner for us. So uh, on the surface, on the surface, um, the natives actually seem barbaric because they are actively promoting this idea of cannibalism, which from a Western perspective, we consider to be barbaric. Right? So on the surface... Um, you can use Conrad here. Idea of cannibalism. Okay, you've got that on the surface. But then, so uh, on the surface, Conrad reinforces the barbaric idea of cannibalism. We see that. Yeah, we're all shocked. Oh my goodness, they want to eat. Right? You know, look at the imagery that he uses with bloodshot, widening of his eyes and a flash of sharp teeth. You get quite vivid imagery that reinforces that, that idea. Oh my goodness, this is, this is savage. This is barbarous. Right? But then, cannibalism. On 
on the surface kind of reinforces the barbaric ideas of cannibalism, right? And you get that in some of the language. It's reinforced with the imagery he uses of what this <coughs> savage looks like, right? Bloodshot eyes, really sharp teeth, okay? But then you get a shift, right? The next part of it is where you get the shift. He actually makes this realization that these guys haven't eaten in ages, okay? So, if you have a look, they're increasingly hungry for at least this month past. Right? It's quite an expansive amount of time. They had been engaged for six months. I don't think a single one of them had any clear idea of time as we, at the end of countless ages, have. They still belonged to the beginnings of time, had no inherited experience to teach them, as it were. And of course, as long as there was a piece of paper written over in accordance with some farcical law or other made down the river, it didn't enter anybody's head to trouble how they would live. Certainly, they had brought with them some rotten hippo meat, which couldn't have lasted very long anyway, even if the pilgrims hadn't, in the midst of a shocking hullabaloo, thrown a considerable quantity of it overboard. It looked like a high-handed proceeding, but it was really a case of legitimate self-defense. You can't breathe dead hippo walking, sleeping and eating, and at the same time, keep your precarious grip on existence. Besides that, they had given them every week three pieces of brass wire, each about nine inches long, and the theory was that they were to buy their provisions with that currency in riverside villages. You can see how that worked, right? You know, he's actually showing a level of sarcasm here to the idea of them you know, paying these savages. Why is he showing sarcasm? Well, here's why. There were either no villages, or the people were hostile, or the director, who, like the rest of us, fed out of tins, with an occasional old he-goat thrown in, didn't want to stop the steamer for some um, more or less recondite reason. So unless they swallowed the wire itself, or made loops of it to snare the fishes with, I didn't see what good their extravagant salary could be to them. I must say it was paid with a regularity worthy of a large an honourable trading company. For the rest, the only thing to eat, though it didn't look edible in the least, I saw in their possession was a few lumps of some stuff that looked like half-cooked dough of a dirty lavender colour they kept wrapped in leaves and now and then swallowed a piece of, but so small that it seemed done more for the looks of the thing than for any serious purpose of sustenance. And here's the revelation. Okay? Why, in the name of all the gnawing devils of hunger, they didn't go for us. They were 30 to 5 and have a good tuck in for once. Amazes me now when I think of it. They were big, powerful men with not much capacity to weigh the consequences with courage, with strength, even yet, though their skins were no longer glossy and their muscles no longer hard. And I saw that something restraining one of those human secrets that baffled probability had come into play here. So he's actually referencing humanity now in the same way that a few passages ago he was making that revelation that they were not inhuman. So he's now addressing that human secret. I looked at them with a swift quickening of interest, not because it occurred to me I might be eaten by them before very long, though I own to you that just then I perceived in a new light, as it were, how unwholesome the pilgrims looked. And I hoped, yes, I positively hoped that my aspect was not so, what shall I say, so unappetizing, a touch of fantastic vanity which fitted well with the dream sensation that pervaded all my days and that time. Perhaps I had a little fever too. One can't live with one's finger everlastingly on one's pulse. I had often a little fever or a little touch of other things, the painful poor strokes of that wilderness, the, prelim the preliminary trifling before the more serious onslaught which came in due course. Yes, I looked at them as you would on any human being with the curiosity of their impulses, motives, capacities, weaknesses when brought to the test uh, of an inexorable physical necessity. Restraint. What possible restraint? Was it supposition, disgust, patience, fear, or, over the page, some kind of primitive honour? No fear can stand up to hunger no patience can wear it out. Disgust simply does not exist where hunger is. And as to superstition, beliefs and what you may call principles, they are less than chaff in a breeze. 
Don't you know the devilry of lingering starvation, its exasperating torment, its black thoughts, its somber and brooding ferocity? Well, I do. It takes a man all his inborn strength to fight hunger properly. It's really easier to face bereavement, dishonor, and the perdition of one's soul than this kind of prolonged hunger. Sad but true. And these chaps, too, had no earthly reason for any kind of scruple. Restraint. I would just as soon have expected restraint from a hyena prowling amongst the corpses of a battlefield. But there was the fact facing me, the fact dazzling to be seen, like the foam on the depths of the sea, like a ripple on an unfathomable enigma, a mystery greater when I thought of it than the curious, inexplicable note of desperate grief in this savage clamour that had swept by us on the river bank behind the blind whiteness of the fog. He's pointing out all the way throughout his amazement at their restraint. And this whole section up here and at the bottom of 145 is him knocking back all the other reasons why they could have possibly been um, demonstrating such restraint. It's not primitive honor. It's not fear. He's saying all of those things will not hold up to hunger because hunger is such a primal thing. It's something else. Right? And he's actually really confused by it. And it's, it's one of those moments in the text where you do get to see uh, uh, that impression that um, these people aren't as dark as they're made out to be. They may be labeled as savages, but they're not obviously as dark. They're showing more restraint than the white people there. And if you recall, we talked about contrasts before we started reading this text. And this is one of those examples of contrast. He's seeing these... Uh, black savages, right, demonstrating an inner strength which is far more pure than any of the white people that are on board this ship. I mean, some of those white people had thrown over their food, right, because of the smell. He says it down the bottom, all right. He actually, he actually justifies it and says it's self-defense. So down the bottom of 144, I looked at, it looked like high-handed proceeding, but it was really a case of legitimate self-defense. We were going mad, eating, sleeping, walking, dead hippo. Right? So they'd, they'd had enough of it. But they weren't taking into consideration the fact that these savages actually needed that to eat. So this passage is a very long passage and you, you have to pick and choose what you get out of it because it does drift a little bit. But there's a lot in there that talks about this contrast that makes the comparison. So, for example, those food for the white pilgrims, they didn't give that to blacks? No, they didn't give the tins of food that they had to the black people. Um, what they did was paid them in copper, which is what he's talking about uh, in this top section of 145. They actually paid them. They paid them a very good wage. But then they never stopped anywhere for them to actually buy any food, nor did they um, really go buy any villages that would help. So you can see how when he's looking at it from a, a distance, he's actually looking at what the white people were doing and going, this is a really... Um, not stupid bit of behavior, but more so a um, really uncaring way to treat these people who are working on the steamboat for, you know, six months, right? Wait, were they like demented servants or were they just like workers? They, actually... they were workers, so they were contracted workers, but, you know, a contract, and he, again, he mentions this as well, some contract that was drawn up at an office up the river that really meant nothing to these savages other than the fact that they were recruited, okay, um, that they were receiving this bit of copper that they couldn't do anything with. So this section is really interesting if you want to start exploring Marlowe's revelation about what these savages are capable of, the fact that they actually have within them an inherent civility that they weren't able to recognize, that the white people weren't able to recognize at any point.